sure. the confusion that exists and misperceptions. Yeah, so I think you know this this virus transmits through very close skin to skin physical contact, often in the setting of sexual exposure. But um, there are other mechanisms for its transmission, including if you touch objects that individuals who've had monkeypox touch, or if, um, if you have prolonged exposure to respiratory droplets. With that said, signaling to people um, who are in the gay, bisexual, other men who have sex with men communities, and also transgender people who have sex with men, that it's really important to have awareness that that's circulating in the community is really a critical part of the messaging while not generating um, you know, inordinate concern and really focusing on the infection as linked to an identity. So it's just an infection. It's not linked to an identity. It just happens to be in the social network. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I, I do want to dig deeper into the racial disparity because it's growing. We sure. sure. It's, a, I, it, it's actually kind of kind of fascinating. Um, I, I'm not highlighting this for any reasons of sexual orientation. Actually, um, monkeypox is what it is. The statistics will you know show show what they show. The way of um, the way of describing this, I found particularly interesting. People are harping on the men who have sex with other men, and I'm not. That's not the issue. The the, the comparison yeah. between the causes of transmission. So I think you know this this virus transmits through very close skin to skin physical contact, often in the setting of sexual exposure. But um, there are other mechanisms for its transmission, including if you touch objects that individuals who've had monkeypox touch, or if um, if you have prolonged exposure to respiratory droplets. It transmits from very close skin to skin contact, typically in the context of sexual activity. Fine, and it also can be transmitted through contact with objects fine when one puts both of those causes or potential causes of transmission together in the same sentence the question that i ask myself logically um in what proportion is it like 50 50 is it 60 40 is it 70 30 or is it like 95 percent to five percent or even more is it like 98 percent skin to skin potentially through contact of, of a sexual nature to 2% touching an object. And if it is, what's the purpose of adding that if it's statistically insignificant or statistically much less proportionate method of transmission? One could hypothesize as to why someone would throw that in as a means of transmission if it might actually represent a fraction of transmission. That's one thing. The second thing that I'm left wondering also is when they talk about it could be transmitted through touching an object. Individuals who've had monkeypox touch, or if, um, if you touch objects that individuals who've had monkeypox touch. Or when I was thinking about it as I was jogging, if you touched objects that an individual with monkeypox touched, are we talking again in, in the sexual setting? At first I was like, oh, okay, they're talking surface to surface transmission, much like they said about COVID in the beginning, we later determined that that was not, it was not through surface contact that COVID was being transmitted. What's being described here, is it touching an object that another individual with monkey with monkeypox had touched? Is, are we still in the context of sexual activity? Are we talking about sharing objects? I mean, I, I'm again, social stigma, which, which this individual is trying to get away from, is a separate issue. We're just talking statistics and we're talking I guess science to some extent, although I, I don't know what this individual's scientific background is. What is the proportion of transmission from object touching versus skin to skin? And when we're talking about object touching, are we still talking about object touching in the context of sexual activity? Those are questions I have. Or if, um, if you have prolonged exposure to respiratory droplets. With that said, prolonged exposure to respiratory people, droplets, okay. Um, who are in the gay but who the individual is Dimitri Deskalakis. And the one question I have is, I, I'm not being glib or facetious. Is he a, is he a doctor? What's this? What's the individual's expertise? That, um, yeah, I saw some of those pictures and I'm not getting into that. P President Biden announces team to lead monkeypox. He's a leading public health expert. This is from the, um, the White House. President Biden announces team to lead monkeypox response. What year? August, August 2nd, a month ago. Today, President Biden named FEMA's Robert Fenton, 
as the White House National Monkeypox Response Coordinator and Mr. Dimitri, Dr. Dimitri, sorry, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to not respect the individual's expertise. Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis as the White House National Monkeypox Response Deputy Coordinator. Fenton and Daskalakis will lead the administration's strategy and operations to combat the current monkeypox outbreak, including equitably increasing the, abil- the availability of tests, vaccinations, and treatment. What the heck does that mean? Equitably increasing the availability of tests. Okay. Fenton and Daskalakis have combined over four decades of experience. I'd like to know how that four decades is proportioned. Daskalakis looks pretty young. So I'm going to guess that Fenton is not so young. If I, if I had to guess here, Robert Fenton. So let's go ahead and see here. Let's just do this one by one, people. We're just going to go through this together. Robert Fenton. Governmental officer. It looks, he looks, if that's him, FEMA, this individual right here, Robert J. Fenton, Jr., That doesn't look too old anyhow. Uh, But you'll be seeing some, um, I mean, you'll be seeing some interesting photos that that others have been sharing on this story. These are just questions that I have as as an individual who asks the critical questions. Uh, When it sounds to me like when we're trying to like just say, oh, it's, it's from sexual activity and also from touching objects, except it's like, you know, potentially disproportionately more from sexual activity throwing in the qualifier uh is it doesn't seem like an it might be an equitable way to deal with it or to address it but it seems like a problematic way of describing it insofar as it doesn't adequately apportion the respective risks of transmission um uh, do I want to show that picture? I don't want to show the picture. If you go to Twitter, you'll see some interesting pictures about uh, Descalapis. Uh, doctor doesn't mean doctor of medicine anymore, Fry. <laughs> well, I know that. I mean, I, I know that that's true as well. Uh, let me just go here, just make sure everything's in order. I know that as well. But I, I, I watched that video, and phrasing is very, is very specific. It's very uh, important. And I, I hear phrasing there that, that seems to attempt to minimize. And then they say, we, we don't, th- these are the statistics, but we don't want to stigmatize anything. Look, fine. Nobody's stigmatizing anything. People just need to know the cause. Uh, they need to know the likelihood. They need to know the statistics so they can make educated adult decisions. Okay, people. Uh, tonight, Sydney Watson, I've spent the day watching podcasts, watching uh, interviews, watching videos. It's going to be interesting. I think Sydney and I are going to have, um, I said Sydney Watson, right? Not Sydney Poitier because <laughs> very, much, very much different. Uh, Sydney Watson, we're going to have a lot more in common than I think um, anybody could have possibly expected that we're going to have in common. It's going to be a good sidebar. Uh, but before we even get there, before we get there, let's just, we have time. I don't see anybody in the, in the back office, in the backstage. Um, hold on. Okay. I don't see anyone in the backstage, but there's, there's another story that, I want, story that I want to get to just before we do this. GQ people, politicians these days, they're not just a privileged class. They're not just celebrities. Let me rephrase that. They're not just... Filthy wealthy living in another realm, dissociated from the people they are supposed to be representing. AOC, first of all, I thought GQ was a men's magazine, I, I like a men's interest magazine. Not that, I, I don't even know where to start on this. I, I started reading the article. It's, it's, it's the rubbish of the highest order. AOC is on the cover of GQ. Airbrushed, modeled. I mean, this is, I said it before, you know, politicians uh, act like they're the new gods. They're acting like the new celebrities, like, like, like Oasis. I expect Liam and Noel Gallagher to be on the cover of GQ. They might have been. I don't know. Not, so, not politicians. Politicians are not the new celebrities, even though they act like it, they get paid like it, they dress like it, and they conduct themselves as though they're the new celebrities. But AOC... Look at this. It's amazing. Oh. Just 
posing. It's, it's, it's magnificent. It's look at this. It's beautiful. It's, it's the new era of politics. I just had to like, I, I perused through it and I'm looking, it's like, oh, look at beautiful earrings. Okay, good. Oh, nice dress. Beautiful. Look, power, power shots, the power photos in front of the Capitol building. But there was one that caught my eye. This one, this jacket people and the, and the, the color coordinated boots. I don't think it's an accident that it looks like the Ukraine flag because I mean, that, that's the world we're living in. Politics, um, infiltrates everything. Are we looking at the same thing? Or are you seeing the same picture that I'm seeing? Yeah, where, where'd the picture go? Here we go. I just had to, for the sake of it, look at that jacket because the credits are in the bottom of the article. That jacket, if anybody's wondering, costs $3,000. It's a very fancy, I had to look it up. Uh, Proen. That's the one, I can't see it. Whatever, it's the one. You'll have to take my word for it. Internet's acting up. $3,000 jacket. Only the best when fighting social justice. Um, all right, people, we're gonna, uh, as, as is going to be the routine now, we're gonna end this stream at some point in the near future, bring it over exclusively to Rumble. I'm gonna have to post the links when we get there. And now I see everybody in the chat. Remember to ask Sydney about her time living in DC. I will when we get there. Geez, I forgot to put the link up in the, we're going to get, we're going to work through all these hiccups. I need to learn a new strategy, a new system. Sydney is the boss. I will be sure to let her know. And I see everyone in the backdrop. So I'm going to bring in, I'm going to start with, let me see here. I'll start with Barnes. Robert, how goes the battle, sir? Good, good. I'm going to go with Sydney now, and then I'm going to rotate. Sydney, how are you doing? Let me fix my audio. There we go. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. This is going to be perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Glad that worked. Uh, okay. So we are on, people. Sydney, in about 10 minutes, we're, I'm going to just make an announcement that we're going to wind down on YouTube and move it over to Rumble. It will not affect anything that's going on here. Okay. Um, but let's... Okay, this is... I spent the day watching some videos. Some that I'd rather not have watched, I think, in terms of interviews and stuff, but others which were phenomenal. Uh, for those who may not know who you are, before we get into childhood memories... And then getting to what you're doing now, which is amazing. 30,000 foot overview, elevator pitch for those who don't know. I am an Australian American cultural political commentator who currently is very focused on, uh, I guess, the abuse of children. But I started off in the men's rights world and now have branched into how much I hate the erasure of women, how much I hate children being victimized. And yeah, that's, that's my general way of doing things. Is that good? Was that good? A good elevator pitch? It's it's very good. But I, and okay. I think I, I I know it's rude, but I have to ask just to get a perspective for age and wisdom. Mm -hmm. What age bracket do you fit in? So I'm in my late twenties. Okay, that's what I. Thought. I I used to think it was a big secret, and then I don't know how people put it together. How actually old I am? The internet has aged me, though. Everyone else thinks I'm in my thirties, and I go, "What are you all doing? Why are you prematurely aging me? Stop this! It's terrible." How did you uh, get into any of this commentary in the first place? So the the like long story short, basically I made one video because I've all, I'd always wanted to talk about political commentary because in Australia most people are pretty politically ambivalent, so finding people who thought similarly to me was really challenging. Uh, so I made one video. It happened to go viral on Facebook, and then I kind of just kept doing it from there. And then I ended up being picked up by Sky News Australia. I got to commentate for them, which was a lot of fun. Um, but again, I mean, like when you're with a population of of Aussies who are just like, oh yeah, it's it's sort of challenging to get on your feet, but people were really, really great. And uh, it kind of just, it just took on a life of its own. H how long have you been in this field for? It hasn't been that long, right? Mm -mm. No, no. So it's been since, been uh, early 2018 was kind of when I started. And it kind of, you know, the first two years were kind of challenging because like I said, I was still in Australia. And then when I moved, I really felt like things kind of took on a life of their own and they sort of just grow and expanded. Um, and, I, and I was actually thinking about this the other day. In a way, I'm sad that I've moved away from talking about Australian issues because I don't want to abandon the Aussies, but I don't know how much they care about them themselves anymore. So I'm kind of like, Ugh. at least Americans are into it, you know, like they're always very reared up and ready to go. So I like that about uh, the United States. Now, uh, were you born in Australia? Yeah. 
And any uh, siblings, and what did your parents do? So I am technically one of six, um, but I have, a, you know, I have a blended, complicated family. So my mom and dad met in the United States. My mom is from Ohio, and then she married my dad. My dad already had uh, four other children, and so like I said, you know, we're kind of blended. There's my brother and me. We're full blood. Um, my parents, well, they started off as pilots. That's how they met. Um, my dad is a business owner back home and my mom, I guess has, she was a stay at home mom predominantly, but she also had her own businesses, um, for a period. And then she stepped back to help my dad in his business. And now she is a lady of leisure. I don't know if she'd appreciate me saying that. Sorry, mom, if you watch this. Oh. Now, now where, where in Ohio was your mom from that the Aussie pilot seduced her? Oh, she's from Cleveland. So who's, who's to say what Cleveland men are like, but she met him in uh, New Jersey, I believe. So, so, uh, Sydney, I'm an idiot. What's a woman of leisure? Well, she just does what she wants. She just okay. gets to sort of float around, you know, in the ethers. I don't mean she's a prostitute or anything like that. <laughs> no, I <laughs> if that's If that that's... was... <laughs> That was what no. it sounded like. No, no, it just, I just I wasn't sure if it was a, a, a term for a housewife, which which I which I had I'd never heard before. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If she'd like me calling her a housewife. So I'm going to go with lady of leisure. <laughs> I'm going to run with that. Uh, yeah. Whereabouts? Whereabouts in Australia did you grow up? So I grew up in Melbourne, which is um, this like a southern state. Um, that's, I guess, kind of, you know, well, Melbourne's not the state, Victoria is the state, Melbourne is the city. Um, and it was a lot of fun. I grew up sort of in the country or country adjacent on a big property and, and you know, got to ride horses and see cows doing what they do. It was, it was, it was honestly a really, really nice childhood that I had. Is there a difference in the Aussie accents depending on where you're from in Australia? I, I think it depends who you ask. I often get told that I don't sound very Australian, which I'm a little offended by, but I understand why the American has definitely creeped in. Um, I, I think it depends on if you're from the country or if you're from a big city like I am. Um, I watched a video actually recently that was explaining that there's a broad Aussie accent, which I don't have any of them, just to be clear, but there's a broad Aussie accent. There's sort of the posh, sophisticated one. And then there's the really rural country accent. And if it's to be fair with you, some of those people, I don't really know what they're saying because they speak really quickly and eat all their, eat all their consonants. So, so, so bor born and raised in Australia and you left to America only in 2018. Uh, so I left to go to the United States mid 2019. Okay. Mm -hmm. Born and raised in Australia, so you're up to speed with all of the Australian issues. You left before the madness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got out just in time. But I, you see, the thing was, I kind of saw the writing on the wall for a lot of political stuff. I never thought that they would go as insane as they did. But I was like, wow, I just, this is not good. And again, like I said, because the population is reasonably politically ambivalent, it's sort of challenging to get people up in arms about things that might happen in the future if it's not happening to them at that exact moment. But I think COVID woke up a lot of Aussies because even now I talk to my friends who, you know, thought I was a crazy person three years ago and they're like, oh, wait a minute yeah she had a point so I, I definitely think having the government overreach so significantly and so aggressively particularly where i'm from victoria went insane uh, i think people just turned around and were like yeah this is not good we the, cannot the, live like this victoria was under the um the, the watch of dictator dan right <laughs> yeah, yes yes dictator uh, dan i don't get well, i forget what his famous clip was about he's the one who says <laughs> i don't i don't give a damn about uh your if you don't want to get vaxxed if you take a position against the vax, you are anti-vax. Yep. Yeah, basically. And then I don't know if you guys saw, but um, the Victorian chief, chief health minister, I believe is what the title is. He said recently, basically that the, you know, the, the jabby jabs weren't doing what they should be doing. And so they kind of misled the population. And I just, it, it's insane to me that they're admitting this stuff now on video for us to watch and go, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, what was your educational experience uh, in Australia? Public schools, private schools, university, et cetera? I went to um, primary school like normal Aussies do, and, and I think most of those are government subsidized. I suppose they're public schools. Um, so I went to a public primary school, and then from there I went to a, they call them independent schools uh, for high school. And that was, you know, my parents paid for that. And then for university, I went to the University of Melbourne and I got my undergrad in, I majored in criminology, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I did a master in journalism and I half finished <laughs> a, a, a language degree, but never got, I think I have two classes left to finish it. I don't know why I didn't do that. It's a bit stupid. I just dropped out in the end was like, yeah, no, thank you. I'm good. 
was it were they was the university you know the the, the wokeness that uh, we're experiencing in the United States a lot of mm-hmm. universities really didn't take off until about a decade ago or so but mm-hmm. what was it like in uh, at, at University of Melbourne well that's a good question because i think i mean it it was what like almost a decade or so since i've it's actually you know a little bit less than that since i've been in school i would say that it was starting to be infected with the the liberalism that we see a lot of in the United States, but I don't think Australians would ever be as bad as. Maybe today they might be, but at the time, I I don't think they were. I think that the general thing was that my undergrad degree was in a social science, and so people were a lot more forthcoming with these bizarre opinions that we see so commonplace today. So I probably got a fair helping of it. And then obviously I went to journalism like an idiot and got an even bigger helping of it. But I had friends who were in, you know, the sciences who were doing biomed and things like this, and they never ran into the same issues that I did. So I would say that, yeah, at the time it wasn't quite as bad, but now I think it's probably comparable to what you're seeing in the United States. You gotta remember, Australia is always a little bit behind in terms of the social opinions or the political opinions of the rest of the world. It's never quite as bad as, just because Australians do have that really laid back attitude about a lot of things. Why do you think they went so nuts on COVID? Um, do you want the long answer or the short answer? Well, long answer is good. You know what, before we get into the long answer, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna wind this down and we're gonna, cause this is where we're gonna start getting into stuff. Uh, that's true. I'm gonna wind it down on YouTube people. And we can all carry it on over to Rumble. <laughs> the link is there. It's in the pinned comment. I'm just going to go. Now I've gotten the hang of this. I'm going to remove the YouTube link. Everyone on YouTube, Viva Fry on you on Rumble. And it's there. I'm not deleting. I'm just removing it. And we 